Michigan is in a lot better spot than it was when I was entering my senior year. That's right. We're talking a little bit about the whore. You are locked on Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Tuesday. I hope you all had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. We are back and doing it now that that is in the past. Locked on Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I'm your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. And I just wrote, um, didn't do a lot of writing this weekend because it was Memorial Day and all. Uh, but uh, I, I just wrote the really, well, I wrote a couple things yesterday, but this is more of like the, the sat down and rehashed uh, what it was like for me in a way in 2007, but it has less to do with me. It was partially the expectations that Michigan had going into that season and the parallels that exist in 2023, but why I don't think that Michigan is in that, uh, in, in that danger zone that it was that year. Now, I didn't address the injuries portion. That certainly was a big part of it, but I don't think Michigan was necessarily critically injured in that season opener against App State. Um, I didn't really see that game. Uh, as I noted there, uh, I was in Las Vegas at the time. And uh, as I went to, for two years in a row, my mom and I went to this uh, horse show. Uh, Spanish. My mom breeds Spanish horses. So she went to like this annual Andalusian horse show in las vegas and we made like a little mini vacation out of it plus it's just kind of was like a little uh breath before going back to school and all of that um so i actually didn't really see that game because that was the first big 10 network game it was not available in las vegas i tried frantically to see it at the sports book i tried frantically to see it in my hotel room big 10 network was not in the west coast at all period at that time so I was spared, basically, is what I'm saying from that. So uh, the reason that I sometimes kind of harken back to that game is because there were a lot of similarities. Michigan went uh, 11-2 and the year before. Yes, they lost in the Rose Bowl. The expectation was they were going to wipe the floor with USC. It just, again, typical Michigan didn't really seem like it wanted to be there. Uh, type of deal, uh, but uh, maybe USC was a better team. Maybe Michigan was overhyped. I don't know. Uh, no way to really tell. And I followed the team pretty closely, but I, I wouldn't say that I had the same finger on the pulse the way that I do now. But uh, went 11-0 and into the game of the century against Ohio State and then lost in the Rose Bowl. Returns the quarterback, Chad Henney. Returns the running back, Mike Hart. Returns the receivers, Adrian Arrington, Mario Manningham, Steve Preston returns Jake Long, returns they lost some guys on defense kind of similarly. They lost Lamar Woodley to the draft, uh, but they still had a lot of players that could play. Um, Sean Crable, I remember, was kind of the centerpiece of that defense. And yet they went uh was it nine and four that year? Yeah, nine and four. Lost the first two. Lost the last two of the regular season before beating an Urban Meyer Florida team. Certainly there were injuries, though, right? Like this, that there was no Chad Henney. Uh, I, 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 you know, it, it, for most of the year, it was Ryan Mallett. I mean, even in the Ohio State game, it was Chad Henney was severely injured and tried his best and couldn't really get things going. But they had a five star in Ryan Mallett who was trying to uh, to overcome the issues that they had. But that was the beginning of the end right like that that year was the best year for the next four um and uh that yeah of course they won 11 and 2 in 2011 and then went downhill before going 10 and 3 10 and 3 uh 8 and 5 uh 10 and 3 was it 9 and 4 i believe the next year Two and four, and then eleven and two, or not eleven and two, twelve and two, and thirteen and one. Uh, so that's uh, that's the basic history of Michigan football uh, since then. But that was kind of the beginning of the the 
going into the wilderness. No one was no one was saying Michigan's back at, in 2006 because they didn't go anywhere. And when you look at the uh, where they were in 2000, going into 2007, yeah, they had lost three straight to Ohio State, but no one thought that that was necessarily like, oh, they they can't beat Ohio State. It was three straight. Um, certainly, there was this feeling that Michigan was a very strong candidate to win a national championship. They were ranked fifth. Michigan, we don't know whether they're ranked right, going to be ranked yet in the, the preseason, but they'll probably be second, third, something around like around there. But why am I more confident that this Michigan team won't falter? Well, because I don't think that this Michigan team, I think number one, it's deeper overall. If there are injuries at any, even at key positions, they have enough to weather any kind of storm really. Uh, but also I just think that this is a more mature team that isn't suffering from any kind of overconfidence because they kind of know they won't sit there and say, well, you look at what Michigan was 16 years ago or whatever. No, they're not thinking that, but in a way they they're, they're talking about legacies. They're talking about cementing themselves as, as the types of uh, players that uh, helped bring a national championship to Ann Arbor about the drought there. It's been 25 plus years, almost it's 26 this year uh, since a national championship All that kind of stuff. So I think that that all plays a big role in why this Michigan team feels like, like I think when you really kind of think about it, the from 2007 forward, that's what they're fighting against and they're aware of it. It's not just, yeah, they have the bad taste of 2020, but a lot of what happened in 2020 was kind of like, oh, you see Michigan actually is not back. Well, what are they coming back from, right? Texas is, quote, back. Michigan has been back for a while. It just hasn't necessarily been elite. Now it's really playing with that term. So I want to read a quote. This is from March. Mike Sainer still said this. Uh, just guys buying in the program willing to do whatever it takes to help his team get to their first national championship. And I'm not sure how long, but that's what we want. We're trying to set a new standard for the program and the teams to come and just being bought into what we want to do here and the culture we want to leave. I feel like this more so guys want to leave legacies when they leave here. And like I personally know for myself, I want to be a guy that when a freshman comes here, uh, like I want to be Mikey Sainer still. For the little kids, I want to, I want to be like Mikey Sainer still. I want to be Blake Corum. I want to be Trevor Keegan, Zach Zinter. I can go down the list of guys who have the opportunity to do that. I think the whole mindset of coming back for that fifth year is all right. Let's put everything into this last season. Let's play everything into put play everything into winning a national championship, and that's the goal. So that is a kind of a recognition of where Michigan's come from and where it's going. And at the time in 2007, it was kind of like, oh yeah, they could do some stuff, but n- no one really thought Lloyd Carr was going to be around for another five, six years, really. We didn't know for sure that he was out, but I mean, it was early in the season. People had signs. I want a less car, uh, a new car with less miles, all that kind of stuff. It was, it was highly thought that this was the, this was the final one. This is more of a build situation that Michigan's in. And you can see that in recruiting. Uh, You can see that in mindset and really just, you see a tenacity that didn't exist before. So it's exciting to watch. I think that um, I, I don't have any actual latent fears. I'm sure no one really does, but it does cross my mind a lot. 2007 and the parallels uh, because they had so many guys returning. The thought was national championship or bust. That's the last time Michigan was really in that spot, at least from a national perspective. Internally, probably it's there's several more years, but that year was the one. All right, um, I want to talk about ESPN. I, I, it really kind of surprised me with where they ranked the offense. They did future offense rankings last week. We didn't talk about it because I saw it, I think, on Thursday, which is the day we did the mailbag, or actually we did the mailbag on Friday. But um, anyway, uh, we're going to talk about that here in just one moment. Before we do that, if you're looking for a delicious snack but don't want all the sugar and calories and you need the best tasting protein bar ever built, you've got to try it. If you're like me and you want to make healthier snack choices but don't want to compromise on taste, then I've got just the thing for you. Built Bars and Built Puffs. I love the puffs. I just finished my box of puffs last night. Built Bars are healthy and they taste amazing. Seriously, they taste so amazing you won't think they're good for you. 
You've really got to try it. Uh, what makes Bill Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and cookies and cream. I'm not really sure how Bilt does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. What's even better is that they're healthy. Only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. Now you don't need to wait to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering Bilt bars at Bilt.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or at Sam's Club while you can still get your specialty flavors at Bilt.com. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section. Grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream bar, double chocolate bar, or coconut puff. Or if you're close to a Sam's Club, go run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hip flavors, brownie batter puff, and churro puff. You can thank me later. All right, so I was kind of surprised when I went on to ESPN and saw their future offense rankings uh which takes into account the next three years it takes into account recruiting returning production expected production all of that kind of stuff and defensively michigan's always been there but offensively michigan hasn't right because i mean michigan even when it's had like a decent offense it hasn't necessarily been like this crazy amazing high-flying thing um i know a lot of people try to memory hole uh the 2016 team Right. And and act like that wasn't really like they weren't up by 21 points at halftime every week. They were pretty much. Um, But that that team, which was pretty much just doing what it wanted to do um, for the most part, did not exactly have an offense ranked super high. I'm 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 pulled. I pulled this up here. Granted, part of it is, you know, they, the games were done, so they kind of took the foot off the gas. I mean, except for Rutgers when they had a the second highest score differential, I believe, in college football history, 78 to nothing. Um, but, uh, I mean, actually, it was 24th in the country. Oh, sorry. Nope, I'm on the wrong year. 24th this last year. I don't know how it moved from 2016. Um, 58th in the country. They're averaging four four hundred twenty four point nine yards per game uh overall last year it was about 30 yards more per 458.8 the best offense i believe in the michigan uh the jim harbaugh era 24th the year before a little bit less in yardage uh i 2020 you don't even want to look at 2019 uh yeah not there 2018 um I'm going to look that up there real quick. 50th. So that tells you that uh, where Michigan's trajectory is and what it's been. And certainly you think back to some of those, like you think back to Georgia, even 2021 to 2022, the offense really took a big, big step forward, right? Uh, Georgia was nothing uh, to, uh, to really scoff at, but it wasn't like necessarily like a crazy offense. It was 25th in the country, one spot behind Michigan two years ago last year it was fifth 501 yards uh, a game compared to 442 so that it happens Alabama went from being mostly a defensive oriented team to having both the great defense and a high flying offense it's apparently what ESPN expects Michigan to kind of turn into especially now they've got JJ McCarthy going into year number three got Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards, lots of different things. And then you look at the future, obviously building around the offensive line and recruiting, uh, and you have Jaden Davis as a, as a future quarterback and things of that nature. So here is Michigan finally cracked the list. They weren't on it the year before. I do not believe, but they came in on ESPN as number five. So, uh, well, they did crack the list. They were number eight last year uh, in the future offense. So they climbed up three, three spots. Uh, But nonetheless, here's what ESPN had to say. Michigan scored 40.4 points per game last season, just the second time it's averaged more than 40 uh, in Coach Jim Harbaugh's tenure. The unit returns mostly intact, beginning in the backfield with quarterback J.J. McCarthy and running backs Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards. Corum, a Heisman Trophy candidate in 2022 until a late-season knee injury, will chase national honors in his fourth season. He will form arguably the nation's best running tandem with Edwards, who finished third in Michigan history in yards per carry, 7.1 last season and provides the ability to gash defenses for big gains 
McCarthy, who had 22 touchdown passes and 500 receptions in his first season as the starter, could remain at Michigan through the 2024 season, which, again, if you've watched or listened to this show, I I still feel pretty adamant that he probably will. Uh, It's personal thought. It has nothing to do with inside info, just a personal thought of knowing J.J., uh, but this team could feel better about its post-2023 plan after landing Jaden Davis, ESPN's number three dual threat quarterback and number 37 overall recruit in the 2024 class. Both Corman and Edwards seem likely to depart after this season, but C.J. Stokes could take on a bigger role, and the team is recruited well with Cole Cabana, ESPN's number six running back for 2023, and Jordan Marshall, number nine running back for 2024. Uh, they continue. This is a long, much, uh, relatively long clip here. Uh, the Wolverines received a boost with the return of fifth-year wide receiver Cornelius Johnson, who led the team in touchdown catches six and finished second in receptions 32. Johnson and fellow senior Roman Wilson provide leadership in the receiver room. The, the key to developing younger players such as Peyton O'Leary, uh, the junior, sophomore Tyler Morris, and incoming freshmen such as Carmelo English. No mention of uh, Darius Clemens, who I think should be on that list, of course. Uh, ESPN's number 80 overall recruit. Michigan, uh, I'm sorry, that's Carmelo English. Michigan will miss tight end Luke Schoonmaker, a second round NFL draft pick, but has high hopes for sophomore Colston Loveland, uh, 14.7 yards per catch in 2022, and added Indiana transfer AJ Barner. An offensive line that won back to back Joe Moore awards loses standout center Olu Oluwatimi, but brings back an excellent guard tandem in seniors Trevor Keegan and Zach Zinter. Transfers Ladarius Henderson. Miles Hinton and Drake, center Drake Dugent should all play key roles, and senior tackle Carson Barnhart will fortify the exterior. No mention of Trente Jones, but certainly he's part of that. The post-2023 line outlook is intriguing, but Michigan has recruited and developed well under coordinator Sharon Moore. So Michigan's only behind USC, Ohio State, Georgia, and Alabama. So that's that's where Michigan is. It's Michigan is is climbing that ladder that kind of goes to, to the, like I said earlier in the first segment, the climb, they're climbing towards something. And while maybe the offense takes a little bit of a step back next year, maybe the defense doesn't take as much of a step back. It'll both, both will lose some players, but um, they're certainly, they, they has a really good outlook. And it's interesting to see that ESPN is so high on Michigan when it seems like there's others. Now that's not saying that it's going to be the fifth ranked offense per se. We, you know, we've seen Jim Harbaugh uh, play just that kind of bully ball. The Michigan State game last year was twenty nine to seven. It wasn't like it was. I mean, certainly if they scored touchdowns instead of eighteen field goals, it could have been a much different game. But uh, they're not always going to be about running up the score. If Michigan can figure out its red zone woes that it's had every now and again, if it, if it can just consistently score touchdowns. It, it would it would be unstoppable, like truly un, an unstoppable force. But that's what Michigan really needs to do if it wants to uh, to win a national championship. So, all right, we're going to continue forward here in just one moment. All right, not a heck of a lot of time left here. Uh, certainly, we could go a bit longer, but. A uh, little bit more bite size for coming off of Memorial Day weekend. I hope everyone had a great weekend. I mean, it was beautiful here in Michigan. Uh, Saturday, I went to my best friends. I always tend to go to Doug's house uh, Memorial Day weekend and just sat out. Uh, Sunday was, uh, I don't, church. I don't know what else I did on Sunday. Yesterday, I, I took Zuri out a few times, mostly just kind of hung out. Uh, and, uh, I mean, today it feels like an oven outside, but it's wonderful. It's just amazing that summer is finally here. Uh, one piece of house cleaning is we're going to do the mailbag on Friday this week, uh, because, uh, there is a camp that at Wayne state university that I will be heading to. And, uh, so I will be there to do that whole thing. It's the, the annual big SMSB showcase. Uh, thankfully, not all the way in Big Rapids uh, and a little bit more local. I much prefer an hour drive over a three hour drive. Um, so there will be there will be some intermittence here and there uh, with the show, just with some travel. Uh, we got Wolverines weekend coming up. I think maybe I can might not miss any days that that week, but uh, that's up in Traverse City and I will be there at that as well. So anyway, um, let's uh, let's get into my final topic here. It's. It, it is still about the future, and it's that Michigan is really 
tw- you know, setting itself forward where it's more so starting to become that trendy school you start to see in a lot of these players' top groups. Over the last week, I swear every player in college, in high school put out a top group that wasn't already committed. They just It was just so many uh, different guys in Michigan. It felt like was in most of them. Will they win all of them? No, but I mean, you're also seeing crystal balls for some of them. Guys like Darian Mayo uh, out of Good Counsel. There was two guys from Good Counsel who uh, where Michigan uh, ended up in their top group. Of, and of course, they're already in Aaron Childs' top group. So they are really... Uh, they're really poising themselves here for the future in a way that maybe there have been times where they were, you know, maybe in like, it seemed like a couple years ago before the last two years, I think it was like in the 2020 era, Michigan was in like everyone's like top eight. And then 2020 happened. It just seemed like guys weren't really necessarily fully considering Michigan. Now Michigan's in like top threes, top fours, top fives, top sixes. And in a lot of cases, really looking good for a lot of these guys. I have some of the names here, but I, I don't know that it, it necessarily matters a ton. I mean, just some of these guys that they're that they're looking at that are, you know, Washington Gonzaga edge defender, uh, Daniel D.D. Holmes. These are guys that I don't even necessarily have on my radar. Like if I was going to do like a best guest list, these are guys that wouldn't necessarily even be there. That is kind of showing it's like Michigan starting to find, you know, be finalist for guys that uh, I, I cover recruiting a bit more, actually a lot more than I had before, but there's just names seem to come out of nowhere with some of these guys where it's like, okay, I obviously I'm well aware of who they've been recruiting really hard for a long time or ones that maybe the names that like Darian Mayo, who I mentioned earlier, who you haven't necessarily heard a heck of a lot about, uh, in recent memory, but still seems like Michigan's trending in a great direction for him. It, it's like some of those guys like, okay, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd put him on the best guest list yet. And yeah, some guys fall off. It doesn't look like I, I last time when we had a best guest list, but I had Boo Carter on there. It looks like he actually is going to be Tennessee bound. But that why that bodes well is it feels like Michigan is, is inching nearer and nearer to that point where they upset for a big guy like it was when Jim Harbaugh first arrived and suddenly entering 2016, Aubrey Solomon is on that list. That's what Michigan needs is to, to, to get itself in this prime position where suddenly it finds itself getting guys that people didn't necessarily think were going to go there. And I mean, if South Carolina can do it, Michigan certainly can. I know it's a much different scenario. Visiting Columbia, I'm sure, is a heck of a lot different than visiting Ann Arbor. But when you look at what Michigan is doing on the field compared to South Carolina, I mean, South Carolina's on the up and up, and they've got a new coach, but they're kind of in the, uh, you know, with Shane Beamer, they're kind of in a uh, in the early Jim Harbaugh type era, right, where it's like there's just excitement because it, it's um, it, it is what it is. So uh, as I say that, a uh, tweet just came through, and uh, Taylor Tatum, and we already kind of knew this, visiting Michigan on June 24th to 26th. Uh, he's got three visits lined up, USC June 2nd through 4th, Oklahoma June 16th through 18th, and then Michigan that final weekend in June, uh, TBA Georgia, TBA Texas A&M, TBA Texas. Uh, Michigan still leading for Taylor Tatum. So it's going to be a big question of, is it going to be Taylor Tatum? Is it going to be Micah Capana? Or is Michigan somehow get three? I don't know that they're going to get three. Uh, But uh, it's, the recruiting is certainly on an uptick. We all know this. It's just a matter of, can they close out on the guys they really want? And can they get a surprise somewhere down the line? I think that they will. I really think that there will be another five star in this class and I wouldn't be surprised if there's two more just because I think that when when you start having that snowball effect mixed with success on the field, then it really starts to work in your favor. And considering the groundwork that Michigan's put in for a lot when it comes to the uh, 
to the 2025 class i wouldn't be surprised if that's a real off to the races class itself all right that's gonna do it for us today we're gonna be back tomorrow uh and we will uh go from there um uh, again uh we will do a different type of show we'll probably re just record two tomorrow on wednesday and uh thursday we'll do whatever we'll do the mailbag and then um We'll probably have like a reactions show that will air on Saturday for the because uh, I don't want to wait till after the weekend because then it just won't get talked about whatever we glean from this SNSB camp where we certainly expect Jim Harbaugh and plenty of other people involved. Anyway, so that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll be back very soon. Peace.